Welcome to Censored. I'm Aoife Vrutnach and I'm reading the life stories the censors didn't want you to see this season. Who knew that so many people were living the wrong sort of lives? This episode is about another woman telling her life story, but there are no ghostwriters or strange ventriloquist tricks this time. Ethel Manon was indisputably herself and she wrote this autobiography without any help. She wouldn't have needed any because she was a professional writer. In her long life, she wrote six works of autobiography. Confessions and Impressions was the first, and she wrote it when she was just 29. Now, this was a hugely popular book in the 1930s. It sold well enough to be one of Penguin's first ever paperbacks. The copy I've been reading was from 1937, and it says it was the 50th printing. It was issued by Hutchinson's Book Lovers Library, which means this is a cheap reprint of a book that had previously sold at a higher price. To be part of this series meant there was a lot of demand from people to buy and own this book, not just to borrow it from their library, like they'd moved beyond the borrowing into the possessing stage. So Ethel's autobiography was a bona fide bestseller. Well, in the UK at least. It didn't get a chance to sell much in Ireland because it was banned a few months after it was published. Confessions and Impressions was number 33 on the censor's blacklist, so it's early on in the life of the censorship. It was the first time Ethel came to their attention, but definitely not the last. I already did an episode on her novel Lucifer and the Child ages ago, which I enjoyed greatly. In total, I've counted at least 11 of Ethel Manon's works that were banned in Ireland. Now, there could be more because she wrote so many and the blacklist is so long and I don't have an accurate index for all of it. But because she published so much, plenty of her other fiction and non-fiction was widely read in Ireland. And she even lived here during the Second World War, writing another autobiographical work called Connemara Journal. But I don't want to tell you who Ethel is myself, because that's her job in this autobiography. So when I sat down to choose a drink to go with the book, I kind of had a bit of a struggle. There aren't many moments involving food and drink. Ethel's observations tend towards the cerebral and the political. She just doesn't seem to rate those sorts of carnal appetites. So I've chosen tea because when she was a child, her mother would entertain her family at long tea-infused gatherings. On these special occasions, the best Doulton china teapot was brought out, and Ethel was given a fancy china cup to drink from. She only got to drink from this at these big tea parties. So I've brewed my tea in the only posh china cup I own, and I've balanced a small biscuit on the edge of the saucer. Tea always tastes better out of China anyway, so this is not a bad way to start the day. When I opened the book, I actually thought, well, this is easy. I already know why it's banned. The table of contents has a chapter heading called Sex and Religion. I mean, that was just too simple. Naturally, the Irish censors would hate the combination of sex and religion. I mean, it's toxic. But it wouldn't be much of an episode if that was all I told you, so I did read the book. I even stopped myself skipping straight to that sex and religion chapter because I restrained myself. But before we get fully into it, I should explain that the book is split into two parts. Part one is called My Own Story and part two is People Who Have Interested Me. So part one is the confessions from the title and part two, the impressions. This is an odd structure, admittedly, until you realise that Manon was quite a well-known journalist in 1930. So her impressions of other people had cultural currency. As a result, I think you could put this book in the celebrity memoir genre as well. Because she's a bit famous, she meets other big names and gives the goss on them. But we're going to start, of course, at the very beginning with the self-portrait section, starting at Genesis, Portrait of My Parents. She opens this by stressing her Irish heritage, 
which was kind of a surprise to me. She's always known as English. It's her father's granny was Irish. She came from Limerick. Unfortunately, Ethel likes to use the old clichés about the Irish. Her father is a dreamy and imaginative storyteller who talks about the little people. In other words, the fairies. Irish readers today can take a short pause here just to allow yourselves an eye roll. I know it's only page one, but you know, take it slow. I'm not too sure, though, the censors would have found this particularly offensive, as it's clear that she likes and respects Irish people. She also doesn't go on about it too long, which is a relief. So there's no malice in it. It's just lazy. On page two, though, she mentions one of her big preoccupations, psychoanalysis. And it's a nod to the vogue for Freudian ideas in the 1920s. It's a very zeitgeisty kind of thing to talk about. As a newfangled and entirely secular idea, psychoanalysis was wildly unpopular with the kinds of religious conservatives who undertook censorship. It was particularly dangerous because Freudian techniques concentrated on childhood expressions of sexuality, a thing that doesn't even exist for lots of people. Freud's influence on Manon is clear at various points in the book because she is deeply interested in childhood as a political and cultural and sexual idea too. A year after this memoir came out, she published a book called Common Sense and the Child, which discussed theories of education. It's not surprising then that education and childhood is a big theme in this memoir of her own early life. She writes two complete chapters on her schooling. The first about her time in a small private school. The second about her years in a publicly funded state school or council board school as she calls it. And like any good Freudian, she recalls a lot of sex and sexuality. In her private school, she remembers boys flashing underneath the desks. And I'm going to read this bit out. It's from page 31. Various small boys would create a diversion in the midst of this welter of tediousness by exposing their little genital organs under the desks for the amusement of the little girls. The habit spread until the older boys used to follow suit. The little girls would giggle but I would be frightened because I had been brought up to be full of shame about bodies in general and genital organs in particular. Well, I can only imagine how horrified the censors were by that bit. And we're not even into the advertised sex and religion chapter yet. On the next page, then, Manon talks about her first crushes, and she's only six, in language that's pretty suggestive of masturbation. I mean, from what she writes earlier, I don't think she actually is masturbating at the age of six, but she's certainly in her memory recalling it in a way that suggests it. So this is what she wrote. He got so much into my imagination that for weeks I would look forward to going to bed so that I could snuggle down into the warmth and dark and secrecy of the bed and indulge the voluptuous pleasure which invariably came with the thought of him. Tell you, that sort of thing, I mean the censors would have combusted reading it. And it's even more shocking because she admits she's in love with a boy and a girl from her school, so she's not even a straight precociously sexual child. For the rest of her chapters on schooling, though, let's set aside the sex for a minute, she's very focused on telling readers about the vulnerability of children to scolding, humiliation, physical violence. Manon condemns the systemic abuse of children she witnessed and experienced. She points out how shame was such a powerful weapon in a teacher's arsenal. Children from poor homes were routinely stigmatised because they caught lice more often and were given free food at lunch. It's really sobering to read how normal it was to punish children openly because of their poverty. Because of other work I've done, I was unfortunately familiar with all the tactics she lists, but this particular one was new to me and it made me so mad that I have to read it out. 
Those of the poor children who came to school dirty and ragged were given print pinafores with which to cover themselves and seated apart from the others. Collections of pennies and halfpence were made in class for the fund for the provision of these pinafores, without regard for the humiliation of the unfortunate children concerned. Fuck. I mean, that's just devastating. It's so cruel. Deliberately so. I just don't know how children stuck with school in these circumstances. I suppose it was only because they were afraid of being taken away from their homes, and that's the only reason they would come to school. Children bullied like this, Manon tells us, they weren't entirely silent. They did tell their own parents, but it really didn't help. Angry mothers who came to complain were subjected to what Manon calls sarcastic contempt from teachers. Her own sense of complicity in the system, as one of the good girls sent to school in clean clothes, is profound. And she's still angry at this, a system she experienced between 1906 and 1916. And it really makes me angry reading it now. The only part that jars in this for me is her ill-founded belief that schools in 1930 were a bit less cruel to poor children. I kind of have my doubts about that. Right, now it's time for Chapter 4, Sex and Religion, subtitled Portrait of an Adolescent. This is a chapter that doesn't disappoint, indecency-wise. The opening sentence is, At school, all the girls were morbidly interested in partuition, menstruation and procreation. Now, I was extremely impressed with this sentence. Hardly any text, apart from very medical ones, mention menstruation. It's a bodily fact that almost never appears in fiction. Yet there's the word front and centre without a euphemism in sight. This is pretty audacious. I think it would have given most readers a dangerous thrill in 1930. Manon goes on to describe her peers' research into this topic, work that began with the Bible, of all things. I do enjoy this image of teenage girls reading the Bible for sex education purposes. Adults probably thought they were being pious, but they were looking for information about childbirth. Naturally, the Irish Catholic Church would see this as positive proof of the dangers of a religious culture that encouraged Bible reading. So the thing is, it's on her way home from Sunday school that she learns how babies were born. Her friends, nudging and whispering, open a page in the Bible and read, Esau came forth from his mother's belly. Suddenly, all of those lies, all her parents' fiction about storks and bushes and cabbages, that all just collapsed. She felt horribly betrayed and was actually really angry. Over tea, which was served with the best china that day, and watercress sandwiches, she blurted out this terrifying knowledge to her mother who said, Well, now you know. Get on with your tea. You've no business to be talking about such things. Which was, I mean, a fairly typical response from a parent caught out in a lie by their child. But of course, the Bible really didn't provide any more detail other than coming from a belly, So the enterprising girls had to broaden their search. And this part is really telling about how people in this. And this part is really telling about how girls denied open sex education, tried to find stuff out for themselves. Manon writes, those of us who came from homes in which there were books made endless research looking up words in encyclopedias and home medical works, such words as confinement, puberty, menses, life, change of. We were both fascinated and horrified. Well, there's a lot to unpack in that. Firstly, the awareness that not every home had books, the rarity of printed volumes in many houses of the working class, Manon isn't really very poor, but she's certainly among the working class. She begins working at 16. Her parents don't keep servants, so she's not middle class. 
And then it's the type of books they used for sex education, encyclopedias and home medical works. These were the kind of books that an aspirational, upwardly mobile kind of working class family might have at home. Useful compendiums of information about the world and diseases of the body. And they were good sources of information. I know this because the censors were very happy to ban those home medical works. A number of them show up on the blacklist throughout the decades. They were often published by popular magazines, like the Ladies' Companion and later Women's Weekly. A lot of the content now was probably advertising, but there was also information about home remedies for earaches or coughs. Obviously, if you were desperate enough, there might even be a few snippets about reproduction. And the good thing is here that Ethel is providing a guide to using indexes for any readers who wanted to start their own research. I do think one of the ways this book was read was as a guide for further reading. Ethel goes into her readerly history in great detail, especially how she educated herself politically. Whole paragraphs of chapters are like book lists. I'm sure those readers who liked her ideas sought out some of those books to read for themselves. Conversely, anyone who disliked her brand of socialism probably made sure to keep those books out of their own houses, in case they'd corrupt the young. For a voracious and sensitive childhood reader like Manon, books had huge power over her. She did take to religion for a few intense teenage years, because she was terribly earnest, but the Bible was usurped in her affections when she was 16. That happened because an older man she fancied, I mean, it's the age-old story, gave her a copy of Thomas Paine's Age of Reason. When she read that, she instantly became an agnostic. I thought it was funny that she chose this book for the turning point, revelatory moment in her reading life. I mean, it can't be a coincidence. Paine's work was deeply shocking in the 18th and 19th centuries, and the British government were prosecuting people for publishing it. Now, of course, by the time Ethel reads it, Anyone could buy a copy, but it still got a certain frisson of dangerous radicalism. Thing is, though, Ethel isn't quite telling the truth of her political journey here. This is just a little overdramatic, and she gives a lot of credit to that man that she fancied. She was actually a little rebel as a teenager at school because her father was a socialist. When patriotism ran riot in her school at the outbreak of the First World War, She wrote an essay quoting Dr. Johnson, saying, Patriotism is the last refuge of the scoundrel. For this daring statement, she was publicly scolded and made to kneel in the hall while the whole school walked past her. Once again, more public shaming. I mean, school discipline would have been nothing without it. Now, this punishment didn't work on Ethel, who then later refused to salute the flag on Empire Day. She told the teacher that her flag was the red flag, an incendiary statement if ever there was one. Another bout of kneeling in the hallway followed. But this conspicuous rebellion caught the attention of a closet communist on the teaching staff, a Miss X, as Ethel calls her. This teacher discussed political philosophy with her student, taught her who George Bernard Shaw was, and so on. Much of this did happen outside of school hours because it doesn't seem to have been weird at this time for pupils to spend time with their teachers on a personal level. They even went to organ recitals together. Now, Ethel is honest enough to admit, because she's a good Freudian, that she was entranced by this woman, that her political education was helped along by the massive crush she had on Miss X. This is what she says. And I loved her, dear heavens, how I loved her. Once when she kissed me at the end of one of our precious, lovely Saturday afternoons, I walked home in a trance of ecstasy. Once again, her childish hero worship is tinged with a certain amount of Freudian self-awareness. Now, naturally, for the censors, this is the worst of all the stories a radical political awakening 
combined with unhealthy feelings and it's girl, it's just awful. I cannot really overemphasize how deep anti-communist fear ran in Ireland in the 1930s. Anyone with socialist ideas risked being accused of communism. There was no way Ethel's memoir was politically acceptable to the establishment in 1930. And yet it was widely read in Britain, where her socialism never stopped her from earning a living or getting published. In fact, she was an acceptable kind of socialist, quite mainstream really, because she wasn't actually a communist. The contrast between the reception of her memoir in Britain and Ireland shows how different the political cultures were in the two countries. In one, the memoir is a bestseller. In another, it's completely forbidden. It's wild, really. So that's the confessions part of the book. What about the impressions? Well, honestly, I didn't really get most of it. I recognised some of the people she profiled. For example, Paul Robeson, Radcliffe Hall, Somerset Maugham. So those bits interested me. But I had no idea who Holbrook Jackson was or Jacob Epstein. And some of the profiles are so random. For example, Ellen Wilkinson MP, her profile is subtitled Portrait of a Woman with Red Hair. I'm sorry, Ethel, but you're just making up the word count with that one. One of the problems, I suppose, with the celebrity memoir is that it can date really badly. Lots of people might be famous at a given time, but only a few of them will be famous like 90 years later. I only know some of the names because of the podcast. I would never have known who Dr Norman Hare was if I hadn't come across him on the blacklist. And that's true of Ethel herself. Her star has definitely faded over the years. Overall, I'd have to say these portraits are a bit meh. A lot of them are based on superficial social encounters or maybe just one interview. If you're looking for deep insights by an intimate acquaintance, you'd be disappointed. She danced and dined with Arnold Bennett, who she describes as a great man, in capital letters, please. FYI, Bennett was a best-selling novelist who also wrote plays and a lot of journalism. In his day, when Ethel sat at the same table as him, he was huge. But she didn't really know him. She just watched him be bored at parties. Literally, I mean, this is what she writes. I have been present at various other dinner parties at which Arnold Bennett has also been a guest and have always been struck by his look of intense boredom. All right, I actually did laugh at this bit. My favourite aspect of Ethel's gossipy bits is just how dull it all sounds. She doesn't portray the social life of intellectuals as riveting and there's nothing more cheering than reading about all those clever people at dull parties. I also laughed a bit at some of Ethel's hammy sentences. I mean, at times her style is ridiculous. Here she is on Somerset Maugham, who she maintains was more of a dramatist than a novelist. Yeah, you see, I don't really know what that means either, but it's clearly meant to be deeply profound. I'll just read this bit out, it's very funny. There speaks the dramatist, who speaks in everything Maughan has written, a cry of pain in the jungle of human nature. It is written there too, in the dark, smouldering eyes, the sensitive, sardonic mouth, the outward and visible sign of the inward and hidden dramatist. All right, so Ethel thought Somerset Maughan was hot as fuck. Good to know. Now, there are 28 separate pen portraits in this book, so I'm not going to talk about any more of them here. If you really, really are desperate to reconstruct the intellectual circuit of 1920s London, read this part of the book. For now, though, it's time to move on to the much more fun stuff. In other words, censorship bingo. We start, as always, with breasts. And you know, I didn't notice she talked about them at all. Maybe because, like, they're just passé. Everyone talks about boobs, but no one talks about menstruation. And then bestiality. No, I wouldn't think so. There is stuff about farms and death on the farm, but I don't think that would count. 
Next up, sex work. Yes, she does mention it just once because she learns about it as a social problem, but she doesn't devote a great deal of attention to the issue. Then we have racism. Well, in her portrait of Paul Robeson, she does veer into the respectable intellectual racism of her time. Much like her vision of the Irish, she thinks that black people embody a more authentic spiritual humanity. This is unfortunately typical of that savage versus civilised dichotomy that was widely believed. Now, in Manon's case, it's important to say she isn't using this to deny black people the vote. In fact, she tries to use it to argue for the greatness of Paul Robeson's artistry. But it's still reducing his humanity to a colour, so I will have to tick it. Then, drugs. No, sadly not. None of the parties seem to feature any drugs. Next, politics. Well, I mean, the whole thing is a political treatise. It's well disguised, you know, talking about education and childhood, but I think it really should be labelled a political memoir, even if it's heavily hidden in a domestic context. Then we have swearing. No, not even referred to, really. Next, infidelity. Well, yes, in two ways. Firstly, Manon doesn't believe in the institution of marriage, so she thinks infidelity and fidelity, that these are pointless ideas. And secondly, Manon herself has a complicated romantic life and seems to have more than one fella on the go at a time. So we can tick this. Then crime. No, actually. No. And of course, genitalia, yes, we can tick that because of the little boys waving their willies about under the desks. Then abortion. Funnily enough, there wasn't a word on abortion specifically. She does talk about being pregnant with a child she doesn't want, but not about if she considered terminating the pregnancy. Next, orgies. Sadly not. Very dull. Then sexual assault. You know, this one, it kind of took me a while to think about it. She admits that she was sexually propositioned by her senior male colleagues, but she never actually says she was assaulted. However, I think there's a real undercurrent there. It's the way she talks about her hysterical resistance, and hysterical is the word she uses, and also at another time that she emerged with her integrity intact from one interview. I mean, that suggests to me something more than just a are you up for it question. So I think we could take this one. Next up, extramarital pregnancy. No, there's no direct references and her own pregnancy is within marriage. Then masturbation. Yes, she does write the word masturbation in relation to her childish sexuality because she sees herself as a, quote, good Freudian. Then sex toys. No, not at all. The next one gave me a lot of thought as well. Feminism. It's funny that for someone so radical, she doesn't really address political equality between the sexes. Her life story is absolutely a feminist one. She starts editing magazines at the age of 16 and she works for herself her entire life. And yet women winning the vote in 1918 and 28 makes no impression on the story. You wouldn't know it had happened during her lifetime. She probably thinks it distracts from the cause of socialism or something like that. Anyway, I think I will still tick it because her personal emancipation looks like feminism to most people, including the Irish censor. Then divorce. No, actually, even though she might have gotten one herself because she was married more than once. Next up is contraception. Yes, definitely. Her profile for Dr. Norman Hare opens with the lines, Don't you know Norman Hare? Oh, you must know Norman Hare. Most amusing person. All contraception and sex reform. Because she knows Hare quite well, this is one of the portraits that's actually quite good. So yes, we can tick contraception. And as I already outlined, we can indeed tick menstruation. Brilliant. Then we have blasphemy. I think so. She's an agnostic, so that surely counts. Then 
oral sex. Definitely not. No detail about sex at all like that, I'm afraid. Graphic violence? Um, No. The scenes of the corporal punishment, she writes, they're not really graphic. They're more political and analytical. And then finally, LGBTQ plus content. I would have to say yes here. It's clear that Manon is aware of sex and gender outside the heterosexual binary. Through Dr. Norman Hare, she knows about the World League for Sexual Reform, which was an organisation lobbying to bring about a greater openness about sex, sexuality and gender. Of course, it debated contraception, but it also argued for a more medical and sympathetic framing of queer sexualities. Manon spoke at one of their conferences. Infamously, the records of this league were burned by the Nazis in 1933. Given the way I think that Manon writes about her childhood crushes, I think we can tick this box. So if I count it all up, it comes to 12 out of 25. Honestly, I'm a bit shocked because it didn't seem to be that type of book. That score is much higher than the average score for books from the early 1930s. Most of them are like three and five Fair fucks to Ethel, she put a lot of bold things in her memoir and it still went on to be a bestseller. She disguised it well. What really strikes me about it is the attention paid to the perspective of the author as a child. The personal part, the confessions, it's much more about her childhood than her adult life. Okay, so you could say she wrote it when she was 29, but she'd had a pretty busy life as an adult. Up to that point, she started working at 16. She was packing a lot in. The emphasis on Ethel the child makes this seem like a very contemporary memoir. Many of them today now take great care to explore an author's childhood and many are about just those years. For Ethel, I think, to talk about childhood was a political choice because it reflects her belief about education, especially sex education. I'm fascinated by how radical this memoir is when I thought it was going to be really very bland. But I suppose I should have guessed from the title. There's that word, confessions. I'm beginning to think it's a code word for intimate, that when something is called confessions, it's marketing itself as titillating or provocative. Ethel Manon surely knew this. She was a smart journalist And she'd started her writing life churning out advertising copy. There were no flies on Ethel. It's no wonder she kept publishing until 1977. So next episode, there'll be another mouthy woman. Because it'll be about Mae West, the most quoted film star of the 20th century. I'm unreasonably excited about this. But until then, please keep your hands clean and your minds filthy. 